hi um it's great to see you all again now um this week is autism awareness week it's actually autism awareness day on thursday this week which will be the 2nd of april um but uh we're on lockdown so we're not doing anything particularly special at the safe about that uh, also it's actually tuesday evening and normally uh, at this time we would have our hope for carers meeting but obviously um we can't have that at the moment either so i just thought since it's autism awareness week I'd do a little bit of a broadcast about um, my first hand experience uh, homeschooling uh, an autistic child. Um, now, I'm a primary school teacher by trade, so I'm quite lucky in that respect. Um, and I've always had a particular interest in autism. Um, I wrote my dissertation on the integration of autistic children into the mainstream uh, primary setting. So um, I'm certainly not an expert in autism. The only thing I'm an expert in, I hope, is my own child. And I sometimes wonder if that's actually even the case. Um, but I don't know that in this very strange time, anyone really is an expert, uh, especially not in homeschooling an autistic child who should be at school when you're not a homeschool practitioner. Um, so I guess my opinion is as valid as any, I hope. Um, now I must apologise, I have to keep looking down uh, because I've got my notes on my lap. Um, probably if you're homeschooling your own autistic child and uh, that's the only other person in the house with you, one thing you're probably missing is eye contact. So I'm trying to make as much eye contact with the camera as I can. Um, but the reason I look down is just so I can read. Um, like everybody, I didn't really know what to expect um, the beginning of last week when we started doing this. I expected that my child, um, who I'm not going to name just because I don't think that's fair, I have her full permission to make this video, um, but I'm not going to name her and I'm not going to use her pseudonym either. Um, so I didn't know what to expect. I thought we would probably have a lot of meltdowns. I thought she would probably be quite angry because it's just so unusual and there was no way I could prepare her for what was going to happen. It just kind of happened. Um, but actually, the first few days, at least, what we had was kind of flappy excitement more than anything else. It was an unusual situation. There was no normal. Um, so it wasn't really out of the ordinary because there was no ordinary for this situation, if that makes sense. Um, we have since had meltdowns, quite a lot of them. I'm sure you guys have as well. Um, but meltdowns aren't necessarily a bad thing because actually what that does mean is that we're challenging our children and we're doing our best to try and push them in a situation where it'd be very easy to give up and say you know what just watch youtube or tv or just do your repetitive behaviors or whatever you want to do all day um so actually when we encounter a meltdown that isn't a failing on our part in some ways it's a victory because it means we haven't given up before we got to that point also we're kind of teaching them to be resilient because actually I know that my child's had quite a few meltdowns, but there's actually nowhere to go. There's there's nowhere she can really go to get away from everybody. She's a child who likes to be outside almost all of the time. And obviously she can't go outside except for in the back garden or just for a short time out the front. So she's had to become very resilient in self-soothing. Um, and she's done an amazing job. I'm really proud of her. Uh, but it's been difficult as a parent to see her very distressed and know there's nothing I can do to help. I don't know about you, but I found that difficult anyway, because I'm quite a huggy person. I'm a very physical person. And the first thing I want to do when I see somebody upset is to hold them and tell them everything's going to be OK. But I've had to learn with my child that actually that makes me feel better, but it doesn't make her feel better. She does enjoy physical contact, but only very much on her own terms. Um, so there's been a lot of meltdowns where I've just had to let her have some time. And then we've gone back and talked over things afterwards. If any of you are feeling like you're failing because your child seems to be having so many more meltdowns um, at home with you than they do at school. Firstly, obviously, I don't need to tell you that it's it's a very different situation and change is always difficult for them. But also in school, it's quite likely that your child has more meltdowns than you realise they do. It's just probably that their teacher doesn't tell you all of them. It's, it, if your child has quite a good day and maybe has one or two meltdowns, a teacher's not going to emphasise that at the end of the day because, um, you know, if they've managed to bring it back round, it, it does. it's not good for your child if they go over old road. It's been dealt with. So it's quite possible they might be having more meltdowns in the classroom than you realise. Also, children almost always will um, act up, if we're going to call it that, more in an environment they feel comfortable in. Now, they feel comfortable when they're at home with you and they love you and they know that you are still going to continue loving them 
even if they have an absolutely epic moment and they might not feel that secure with their teachers. So that could be another reason why it's happening more at home. Also, although you'd think there's less sensory overload at home, most things that, that really um, autistic people find painful um, are people noises, things like breathing, chewing, um, those little sniffing sounds we all make, those little motions we all make, um, catching things out the corner of their eye. And all of those things are actually more noticeable, I think, probably in a home environment than they are in the classroom. Um, it's probably been really tough. I know we've had a lot of reasonable days. We've had a couple of really good days and we've had a couple of really, really terrible days. Um, and emotionally, as the person that's supposed to be there for them, that's really difficult. Um, and you want to be able to express that stress and that's really hard. And I know you don't need to be told this, but just to remind you that the more stressed out you are, or the more stressed out you appear, the more stressed out your child will become. Quite often, autistic uh, people, especially autistic children, will look to you to be their emotional regulator. So if you are behaving in a het up way, that is how they will continue to behave. Now, you can also use that to your advantage. This morning, we had we had an awful day yesterday. It was really not good. Um, but today has been so much better because this morning, from the minute I woke my child up, I woke her up in a really over the top positive way and was just super happy. And because I woke her up in that way, that kind of set the tone for the day. And that's the way she carried on. I was also much more careful with my language choices today. So instead of saying we will do this or this will happen or now we're going to do this, I made sure I used words like um, would you like to do this or shall we do this next or when shall we do that because in using the language of choice it meant that if she was defiant and said no I could say that's okay I only asked you I didn't say we had to so without undermining myself and therefore without her feeling insecure I was able to manage the situation naturally we did all of the tasks that we were supposed to do but I just used the language of choice and then after saying shall we do this or shall we do that? The next was, well, we did the first thing. So now we are going to do that. So I did use that firm language as well. We have a rule in our house. That if we say we will or we are, if we use definite language, that is something that definitely has to be done. It doesn't matter how many meltdowns there are. It doesn't matter how many temper tantrums are thrown or how traumatic it is. It's a thing that will be done. It will be done with help and it will be done with scaffold and it will be done with love, but it will be done. And that is to make both of our children feel safe and secure because they know that if mummy and daddy say something, that thing will happen. That thing is like a, a wall. And I do think that helps them to feel safe because it feels it makes them feel like they can trust us. But we do have to therefore be careful with our language. And I will also always make it really obvious. So if I say, um, would you like to do your maths now? And I get a no, then I'll say, that's okay. I said, would you like to? I didn't say we have to. So we can choose to do something else. So I always say we, I make myself part of the scenario as well. And equally, if I say we are going to do this now and I'm hit with a no, then I say, okay, take a minute. We are going to do it because mummy said we will. And in that way, it you can kind of judge by their mood whether you need to use the language of choice or the language of affirmation and um it just helps keep a level keel and it gives you a little bit of a get out if you need it um but it's not something obviously to be used all the time we also tried something else today we tried um marble jars to help with focus so um we use marble jars for rewards anyway we keep them up on the mantelpiece but i got a smaller jar and i said okay for every minute that you stay focused and on task I will give you a marble in your jar and each marble that you get in your jar um, that's a minute of free time you can have now the work that my children are being set from school is supposed to take about 90 minutes I think nationally that's what's being recommended so the absolute maximum amount of free time that they will earn um, will be 90 minutes now obviously you know they're awake for like 12 14 hours of the day it's not difficult for me to give them 90 minutes of free time at the moment so that's working quite well um, and it was quite good as well because I have um, two children who I'm homeschooling. One of them 
is lovely and personable and bouncy and gregarious and sociable and loves cuddles and just has the most absolute butterfly mind. Whereas the other one, um, who is my child who has autism, is very fixed and task orientated. So it was actually really great for me to see her marble jar going up and up, up and up and reminding myself that although it might be difficult to actually get her to engage in something, when she's engaged, she really is fully engaged and actually she's much easier to keep on task than my other child. So that was really nice for me to just celebrate some of her differences which are um, positive and uh, rather than focusing on the negative things and the, and the roadblocks we've been hitting all the time. So that worked really well for us. If you have a child who's time orientated rather than schedule or task orientated, it maybe won't work so well. But another thing we've done is we kind of split their free time. So we haven't been starting lessons in our house till 10, 11 o'clock, which means they can have some free time first. Then we do some lessons. Then we have lunch and then they can have some more free time at the end. Because I figure if we start at 9 a.m. and we're done by what 10 30 maybe even with meltdowns we're done by 12 one o'clock that's a lot of the rest of the day to fill so it's quite nice to split it up like i say it won't work if you have a child who's quite time orientated didn't work very well the first couple of days because um my child kept telling me it's 12 o'clock it's lunchtime and i kept saying but we only started like 20 minutes ago after we had our PS, and, and she kept saying but it's 12 o'clock it's lunchtime and I realised I hadn't really communicated well with her about what we were doing. But after I explained it and I explained the benefits of what we were doing, she got it and she got on board. Um, but like I said, she's much more task orientated, actually, than time orientated. I don't know why she was thinking about time um, in this particular moment, but it's just something that might work. Um, everybody's going to have some teething problems. When you try something, sometimes it's going to be great and then it'll just fall apart the next day. And sometimes it's going to be terrible and you're going to wonder why you even tried it. Use your language choices carefully whenever you introduce something new, because if it doesn't work, it means that if you've used the language of choice, you can revert and do something else. Whereas if you make it a hard set in stone, this is what we're going to do and that's it. And it's something brand new. If it doesn't work and it's a complete disaster, you're locked into that then for the whole day. Um, so, so just do think about the language you use and do talk to your child about it because your child has a social communication problem. They, they, they won't necessarily interpret your language in the way you're saying it. And they need a lot of overemphasis. And also they tend to find repetitive behaviors really comforting. So if you're saying the same thing again, and again, and again, in the same way that probably they say things again, and again, and again, and you might find it annoying, um, they find it soothing. So use that to your advantage as well. Um, celebrate the little victories like I said I was just it was so great to see how brilliant she was at staying focused and um that was a little victory we celebrated um another little victory we celebrated is when we finally cracked it with the whole idea of having free time and then a little bit of work and then some free time at the end um that all slotted into place and suddenly started working really well and it was great um I managed to get my child to do some art today uh she didn't finish it but she she started it it wasn't self-selected art it was art that she was set by her teacher and she actually started it so okay we didn't finish it but we'll come back to it tomorrow and I was just so proud of her for doing that especially after yesterday which was just a write-off um if you have the option of sending your child into school so oh, there we go I'm touching my face loads I'm not supposed to be doing that I'll sit on my hands um as I said I'm a primary school teacher and um I was on shift and we had the option my husband and I of um sending her into school uh because I'm a primary school teacher and we made the decision not to do that now that changed the schedule um we had a big meltdown a big temper tantrum and lots of anxiety and fear on her part because we changed the plan and with so much changing already we were kind of lying in bed kicking ourselves thinking have we done the right thing have we done the wrong thing having now myself been in school we definitely did the right thing because at the moment school is not what they're used to at all um we aren't allowed to to touch the children well I mean we can but obviously it's risky we're trying to maintain social distancing in schools so we're trying to stay two meters apart and encourage them to stay two meters apart um that's really hard it's very unusual a child with a social communication disorder is likely to interpret that as her teachers no longer liking her um which is not the case obviously but it's difficult um to explain the actual situation and what's happening and it's also just totally different. It's another different thing. So rather than 
homeschooling being totally different to school going into school is also different to school which because it's a, a familiar environment but a completely different scenario is likely to be even more distressing so obviously you have to do what's best for you and your child but if you're really struggling and you're thinking of that as an alternative because your child's on the vulnerable pupil list and is therefore allowed in school i would really say just just think really carefully before you do that that's all um yeah um think about your environment i'm sure you've all done this already uh but we our work environment is at the uh living room table and there was there's been a lot of stuff on the living room table and i think one of the things which um my child's been finding very difficult is having her little brother there kind of making noises and also he's hearing impaired so he's very loud anyway and she doesn't like his playing noises and she doesn't like the sound of him breathing or him eating or him interrupting her and all of these things so she's got all of that going on and he has a right to an education too so my policy is just very kindly reminding her that, you know, he has a right to exist and he has a right to play and all of these things. And we have some rules like we don't have playing noises in our house, but he is allowed to breathe and he is allowed to eat. Um, so she kind of has, just has to get used to that. But I think that combined with a very busy table with all kind of things on it and everything and the light coming in through the window and the buzz of the various laptops and stuff has just been too much. Um, so today she wore her, she's got uh, glasses and she's got uh, reactions lenses so she wore them today so we could have the curtains open without the, it being too bright for her also when she was listening to videos even though she didn't need them she had headphones on and she actually chose to keep the headphones on for a little while after she'd finished listening to the video this is an ongoing battle we have in our house because she absolutely hates um noise reducing headphones or ear defenders i i think because she's a preteen, she's becoming aware that people may judge her for things um so there's that and also i think they kind of squeeze her head a bit whereas headphones aren't as squeezy so she left them on so i think tomorrow i might start with one of the videos she's got to watch and then if she chooses to leave the headphones on that's great i'm not going to mention anything i don't want to spoil the magic um but that did work so if your child has sunglasses but you know if you really need to get some sunlight into the room maybe open the curtains get them to wear sunglasses indoors um try and keep the environment as unbusy as possible try and make sure that nobody else in the house is making a cup of tea all those kind of things um without warning your child first because in quite a quiet space like a house those are all noises that are going to cut right through their brain um explain everything even if it seems like a really simple thing because your child's having to use an awful lot of brain energy just simply by the fact that everything has changed so if you just explain everything to them everything you're doing everything they're doing again it's that repetitiveness that they find very comforting um and also use that affirmation if you think they're getting stressed before they get to the point of being angry say to them i think you're beginning to feel stressed or i think you're beginning to feel heightened if they tell you something like i feel really angry say to them you feel really angry say it back to them it validates their feelings we always say in our house anyone is entitled to a feeling your feelings are never wrong it's never wrong to have a feeling it's what we do with those feelings that can sometimes be right or wrong so encouraging your child to own their feelings and not feeling ashamed about their feelings but maybe accepting those feelings and using those to help guide their actions rather than their actions becoming out of a control as a result of their feelings can be really helpful. I'm really lucky that I've done some uh, forest school training recently and that's something that's come out of that and kind of looking at those play theories as well and schemas and Piaget and Vygotsky and all these um, different things that I hadn't looked at since I was uh, doing my degree has really helped me. Um, and, and it's just those really simple things um, affir affirming how they feel makes them understand that you're not cross with them because they're feeling a certain way you're just trying to control um, their reaction to it fixation and obsession are oh, my daughter became absolutely fixated earlier so this artwork she had to do she had um, seen a picture of something online that was called uh, Grand Canyon um realistic picture and it turned out it was a sketch of some rolling hills in sussex or something and it wasn't the grand canyon at all but because it was called that she was absolutely determined that's what the grand canyon looked like and even after i showed her a video of what the grand canyon looked like she still drew the rolling hills so in the end i said okay you can finish that drawing that's fine but that is not what we are supposed to be drawing so i mummy doesn't mind do you finish that 
but then we have to do a Grand Canyon picture. And so she did. And then she did do the Grand Canyon picture. And like I say, she actually got reasonably far with it. And I was really proud. Um, but just watch that they don't become fixated on the wrong detail. Uh, that happens quite a lot to my child anyway. But in education, it happens all the more. And it's something that your child's teacher will know to keep an eye out for. Will maybe think, oh, I said something in this tone of voice. Or there was something that was that colour. And I know that particular child really likes that. And I bet I just need to check they haven't focused on that and the wrong detail. Um, but it can happen by accident quite easily. So so do look out for that. But equally, if something they're fixated on or obsessed with is helping, then just use it for everything. Um, I taught a child once who was absolutely obsessed with dragons. She loved dragons. Everything was about dragons. And so we just made all of her work about dragons because ultimately that was something that brought her comfort and familiarity. It was just like the repetitive language, the repetitive behaviours. And if I wanted her to write a non-chronological report and she'd write it if it was about dragons and she wouldn't if it was about rivers, what the heck? She can write it about dragons and she can watch a YouTube clip or something about rivers so she has the information about rivers. Um, you know, find ways around it. Do adapt work if you need to. Basically, at this stage, if you're managing to get your child to do anything that isn't self-selected learning, well done. You're doing a great job. If they're melting down, but you're not tearing your hair out and throwing the towel in, you're doing a great job. If they're not melting down and they seem withdrawn, but they're coming to you for a cuddle at the end of the day, then you're doing a great job. If you if you haven't committed a murder yet, you're doing a great job. Again, we always have this joke in our house where I say, well, at least nobody died. But right now, honestly, if you're managing to get by, particularly if you're a lone parent, I'm really lucky that I have a supportive spouse who is there to help me all the time, even if it's just kind of to sympathise with at the end of the day. It makes all the difference having someone else there. If you are completely on your own in this, you are amazing. Whether your child is autistic or not, you're doing an incredible job and every single person in the nation is proud of you. OK, keep doing it. You're being brilliant. And if there's someone that you can phone each day and just talk to about what you've been going through, please do that. Please don't ever be ashamed as well of just saying this is really tough and I need some help or I just need someone to talk to. We're all feeling like that. I'm feeling like that. I'm a primary school teacher. This is genuinely my actual job and I'm finding it really tough. So if you haven't killed anyone, well done. Keep not killing someone. Give yourself on the pat a pat on the back and just keep smiling and try your very best for the sake of you and your child to don't worry and be happy even when it's hard well done